I think it's about time that we got this Packard Bell restoration done and dusted. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the new lab. Uh, this is an area that we recently built. There's a whole episode on the building of the lab and it allows us the facilities to get properly stuck into restorations and repairs again, have all the tools to hand, although the actual toolkit that's around me will grow in time as I get used to, again, because we used to have a lab in the old cave, as I get used to what I need around me to make these things happen. So with the Packard Bell, I want to get it looking, feeling and operating like new today. And that's going to start with the plastics and cleaning. In the last episode, if you haven't already seen it, all the links are down below in the video description. We cleaned up the electronics. Um, we also tackled a smashed monitor. And let me give you a little bit of news on that monitor because we had three monitors. One arrived smashed, that was our first one, but was working miraculously. Another one was moldy and was not working. The PCB was sort of moldy and there was rust on it. And then another one needed a good clean and we got it working. And that's the one that we've got earmarked for the final restoration today. However, there's some good news. That moldy one that didn't work, we got it working. There were just two bad capacitors on it and um, then it fired up and worked so we could put it back into its original case and that can live again and be used another day. And we found a use for that one in the smashed case that was working. It is the perfect fit, would you believe it, for this. This is a Stratovox cocktail arcade cabinet originally a Space Invaders 2 that somebody would have converted back in the day to Stratovox. And what we're going to do is drop that monitor in here. It fits perfectly. We don't need to make any modifications to the original cocktail cabinet. Everything we do will be completely reversible if you want to take it back to the original board and monitor at some point, if we can acquire a working board or fix the board that was in there. We'll pair it up with a Mr. Multi system and it will be the perfect cocktail cabinet with multiple games in there so that people can enjoy them either up here or more likely down in the arcade archive. So all of the monitors have a life in future. None of them have gone to waste, which is great news. I'm really pleased with that. Okay, let's start with the plastics. And that means we're going to need to clean the case. And then we're going to need to do a bit of vapor brighting to get some of these yellow bits. Let's look at the state of them and then we can do that work. we'd like to thank PCBWay.com for supporting our episode today. They aren't just about PCBs, although they do do a tremendous job of that. They also offer CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection moulding. If you're creating, then PCBWay.com can help you bring your project to life. Get an instant quote now over at PCBWay.com and we thank them for their support. Right, so we've got a lab, we've got a desk and some tools. So we've got no excuses not to clean this up of the former owner's dead skin and grime. Some of the trim on this machine is gray, which has turned a kind of greeny brown color. So I'm interested to see if my normal vapor bright technique will fix that. And we'll try and get anything else that looks a bit yellow back to an original color. We want this thing to look just like it came out of the catalog. The mysteries of plastics mean that the floppy drive and the rear of the case here seem to be just fine for yellowing, so they'll just need a scrub and a quick clean, as does everything else to remove the dirt in the first instance. So I wheeled in the bath and I set about scrubbing. Now notice the postcode on the case here is written in a UV pen, which has turned a darker color. We're gonna revisit that a little bit later. And not before I've scrubbed this machine like an old man sat at a potter's wheel working all of the dirt out of the textured plastics and then wiping them down. Something about this new lab area I really like is the matting I've put down. It's great for putting damp things on the floor and then I can just mop up any residual water later. Let's pop the CD fascia off now for cleaning. This is definitely quicker than the standard drive would have been when the machine came out in 96. This one dates from around 98, but it is the kind of upgrade that would have been installed in the machine during its working lifetime. I think I went from a single speed to dual to eight to 16 to 32, and then finally 48 in my CD owning lifetime with my first CD writer being, I think it was four speed. It's amazing how cheap they became compared to the prices we were paying when they first came out on the market. Now the keyboard, that is pretty mint. In fact, it was sold as new old stock, but I do want to clean it. I want to do a thorough job of this and that means stripping it down. I was in two minds about keeping the sticker on the spacebar as that seems to be a bit funky around the edges. I have settled on keeping it. It seems a shame not to and people need to be warned not to strain themselves when using the machine. 
Let's pull the keys then. No chat up lines required, just a keycap puller today and some sped up footage. I'll take them off and pop them into some soapy water to soak. The more keys come off, the more filth and hair that I actually find under them, even though this is new old stock. And it does seem to have yellowed just a little bit. It's hard to see, but it has yellowed a tiny bit on the front of the casing. This isn't an expensive keyboard. Here's a key with a plastic plunger on the back, which just pulls off. And if we peer down to each hole on the keyboard, there's a rubber dome, a blue rubber dome in there with a carbon conductive pad on the rear that makes contact with the keyboard membrane underneath. No springs. No switches, this is low cost, mass produced budget computing with added hairs and grot from the ages. Off now come the last keys and there's a little surprise under these ones, two pink plungers. They seem to be identical in all but color, but there we are, pink plungers under our numeric keypad. As we open up the keyboard, there's the membrane and the control board at the top right of the membrane. And then we'll tip it over and there are all of those plungers and domes, which I'm desperately trying not to lose off the top of the table here, or I'll be in trouble when it all goes back together. I just scoop them all up for safekeeping. And in doing so, the true face of Packard Bell is revealed. Wipe that smile off your face, mister. A quick brush and hoover of the hairy bits, and this is ready to go in the bath too. I do need to find my brush attachment for the hoover, which would have made this job a little bit easier, but I've put it in the safe place during the lab build. So um, I'm hoping it will turn up eventually. A quick wipe of all the keys, clean them up. And then I just worked around the label of the spacebar with a cotton bud, which it did lift some of the yellowed gunk and the old glue around the edge of it. But if I mess with it too much, I think those edges will just curl up to the point where it will just become annoying. Two pints of keys, please. Let's put them safe and hope I've collected them all up. And then we have all of the parts cleaned and ready for vapor brighting. There's that front, which is yellowed more on one side than the other. The CD drive fascia, which is a consistent yellow across it and the lid of the case, which is yellowed around the edges and remains white where the monitor sat in the middle. I'm sorry to report it's another grey week in England, so we're in the potting shed with our plastics elevated above a pool of liquid peroxide in the box here, and then I'll pop the lid on and leave the vapours to do the rest. This is not a quick process without the sun to help us, but I'm finding it is consistently a safe method to use, which gives us good results, when the sun did make a brief appearance, I got the box outside, but there was still a chill wind whipping around the box. So I tried to use the wall here for a little bit of shelter. Bubble away, my little beauty, and relive your youth. For the lid, I had to go out and buy a bigger box because at 18 inches wide, it was not gonna fit in the one I had. So here it is in a larger box, hopefully turning back time, and soon I can share the results. One thing I did notice when looking at the greyer plastics is that the postcode written in invisible ink here seemed to retain the original colour. The fluorescent ink would have been invisible when applied but visible under a UV light. There's nothing conclusive to be drawn from this because plastics seem to act differently. The same pen on the lid that we saw earlier looked darker for example. But in this instance, it seems that the ink has preserved the original colour perhaps by reflecting the UV light like a kind of sunscreen. This is an observation and my musings rather than any kind of scientific fact, but it's an interesting observation nonetheless. We'll return now to our chassis, which is ready to have the system put in it. So let's hoover up yet more dead skin cells. There's no rust to deal with here, thankfully, but uh, I do like to polish up any lightly tarnished metals with a bit of oil, such as the expansion slot blanking plates. So we'll give them a little bit of a rub down as well as the rest of the case. And now the cave is filled with the comforting smell of oil on metal. 
In goes the motherboard and we'll screw that securely in place. And I did remember to put the rear plate on the ports. Um, if you don't do that, you'll be taking the motherboard out again to install that. And then onto the CPU, a pea-sized, or a generous pea-sized amount of thermal paste popped onto the top and then the heatsink clips on. While this CPU doesn't need a fan, I'm on the lookout for a suitable one, just in the name of longevity really. It's nice to keep the temperature down where we can. Now the RAM, which I've upgraded from the original 16 megs to 48 megs, occupying the four slots there. That's a good chunk and it should keep our swap file down in Windows. Then we pop in the PCI and ISA riser cards. That slots in there into the motherboard. Three ISA and two PCI slots are available to us. And then that's supported on top by a strengthening crossbar, which also serves to make the whole case much more rigid. I love how clean this is all looking inside there now. The front fan here clips into place. And then the ISA cards go back in, including that all-in-one modem and sound card. Let's talk about the hard drive again now, because I have news. You'll remember when I previously checked this out, it was showing the wrong capacity and there was no readable partition on the drive. Well, I've taken another look, a closer look, and I noticed something on the connector under my microscope here. A single broken joint which one tested has no continuity. Now, how did this happen? It's a joint on the connector, and it could be the reason that the previous owner gave up on the machine, or it could just as easily have been me removing the cable heavy-handedly when I first got hold of this machine. I'm not sure, but it's worth a shot at fixing, I think, so I just brushed on some flux, and then I bridged the brake with a stroke of solder. It really does feel good to have the soldering iron back out again. When I plugged it in this time, we saw the correct size. 1,275 megs was reported, and while there were still no readable partitions on there, I did a quick scan with a recovery tool and I found that there was previously a FAT16 partition full of files. Now, it wasn't able to restore that partition table, but it could extract all the files and it seemed to copy them all perfectly. So, next up I tried to create a new virtual disk, a VHD, a virtual hard drive, and I applied a hotfix, now that's a patch for Windows 95, that allows you to run it on a faster CPU than you would have had back in the day. There's a bug when it hits a certain CPU speed. And hey presto, look at this, I'm booting up our Packard Bell in a virtual machine and I'm browsing the files on it. Granted, it's in 16 color mode because I don't want to mess with the drivers before I put this back onto the real hardware, but it's interesting to browse nonetheless. There's things like Championship Manager 99 on here, there's also the bundled Packard Bell software that we saw in the catalogue, including Navigator and uh, Encarta 96 was on there. And apparently someone called Toasty had their 18th birthday when this document was made in Publisher, which would make them about 43 years old now. Toasty! There were also lots of sensitive documents on here, including CVs and letters with personal information in them. I will be removing those, but if we can get this working on the real hardware, we can poke around some more and maybe look at the applications that are on here. Or if that all falls over, we can hopefully resort to an original master restore CD and get it working like new. Final fixes then. The floppy drive always deserves a bit of a service, so I popped the lid on that. I gave the read-write header clean with some IPA. And then I dug right inside the drive for a good clean. Now it's a lot dirtier than it looks, as you can see on the cotton bud here. And all of that filth has the potential to get into my discs and on the drive head. So it's well worth giving this a clean. I also cleaned the worm screw of old grease. And then we popped some fresh lithium grease on there. And that should be good to go. Likewise with the CD-ROM drive, although this was much cleaner, a quick wipe of the laser and then once again wipe down the worm screw and put some fresh grease on there and that should keep it going strong. And with that, I think we can put the whole thing back together and see how it's looking and if it does indeed boot up with the files I was able to recover.
Hey guys then, I've cloned my recovered files on the virtual hard disk over to our disk on module and I put that into the IDE port on the motherboard and I put it all back together again. Just to remind ourselves this was the machine as it arrived, filthy inside and out, and this is how it now looks today. I'm really happy with the progress that we've made on this. There's not a speck of dust inside it and the outside is looking much better. The vapor brighting went well, I think, as well as it could. And I think the monitor looks really great now we've paired it up with the machine. But it's no good looking pretty if you can't do anything. Words I motivate myself with in the mirror every morning. So let's hit the power button. And it boots straight up into Windows 95. As it comes to life, there's the splash screen for McAfee Virus Scan 95. And that is the very same antivirus that was shown in the original software bundle in the catalog. And then it loads the horror that is Packard Bell Navigator, a desktop interface replacement that should be uninstalled at the first opportunity. As it's loading, it's not without issue. It tells us there's a DLL file missing, in particular one that's used by applications designed in Visual Studio, but I'm sure those dependencies can be reinstalled or re-registered to fix that quite easily. I'm now gonna just let Packard Bell Navigator play for you for a while because this PC seems to have been possessed by the ghost of Max Headroom. Welcome from Packard Bell. Your Packard Bell computer offers two computing environments to choose from, our Navigator Home environment or Microsoft Windows. Press button 1 to go directly to Navigator, or button 2 to go to Windows 95. Press button 3 for an overview of Navigator. Press the number 3 key on your keyboard for a quick lesson on using your mouse. To customize your setup and secure your computer so that more than one person can use it, press button 4. Aside from the stutter wrap, I found that the sound card is working just fine in Windows. Here's some MIDI music playing now, that's Claire de Lune, and it's a mostly happy PC. Although in my computer I found that my floppy drive was missing, my CD-ROM drive was also missing. I have created a separate D partition on the additional hard drive space we had above and beyond what the original disk had. And the missing floppy and CD-ROM drives was missing partly down to my own stupidity because if I went back into the BIOS, I found that the floppy drive was disabled and my hard drive replacement, my DOM, was in the secondary IDE port. So I swapped them around. I set the CD-ROM drive to master and put that in the secondary channel and the DOM on the primary channel. And then they both show up just fine in the BIOS, as you can see here, but they still don't show up in Windows. So there's some drivers or there are some software settings to tweak there to get that working. I also set the date and time in the BIOS and I've put a new coin cell battery on the motherboard, so that will retain the settings. And of course, I had to perform the toasty test to make sure all was well. So I opened up Publisher 95, which informed me that a Packard Bell ColorJet 9000 printer was missing. It is, and I think that would have been a rebranded Lexmark printer back in the day. Printer's not really my thing. I'm not a collector of them, if I'm honest, but I would make an exception for a Canon BJ10 if it came my way. I do have a soft spot for those. Toasty's poster appears looking better than ever on a CRT, and Toasty is older again since we last looked at it. Let's take another peek at the plastics and that grey fascia on the front. It did respond to vapour brighting quite well. There's still a slight discoloration on the right hand side of it, but it's a hell of a lot better than it was. And that piece of plastic clips off, so it'd be very easy for me to just give that one more blast with the hydrogen peroxide before the final episode. But the important thing is that we haven't caused any marbling or any other problems that can't be reversed. And on the top of the case, you can see it's much less yellow than it was before. It's not quite as shiny and white as the front, but pretty white and again I think that's a good result by my book compared to what we started with. Well we're getting really close now to how this looks in the catalogue. I don't really want to go out of my way to buy the, the skinny little microphone that's sat by it and the multimedia panel that sits on the top because I'm not going to use them but something about me desperately now wants to source those just so I can make it look exactly like the picture in the catalogue. What is wrong with me? Why do I need to do this? Uh, so if you've got any leads on those parts, let me know, otherwise I'll be trawling eBay. It won't be the end of the world if we can't get hold of them, but wouldn't it be nice just to reproduce that picture exactly for our final episode? And in that final episode, I'm just going to iron out the creases 
fix those odd driver problems that we found. Perhaps do a complete restore with the master CD. I think I've got the original master CD. If not, we can fall back on that drive image that we've now got and fix that. I don't really want to use that drive image, especially in the public space, even if I've deleted those CVs and those personal files. What's to say someone might undelete them? I'm not sure why they'd go to the bother of doing that, but it's a possibility. So I just want to completely black the drive, if possible, with a master CD and get that brand new experience. And then we'll play some games, some games that I remember from that Pentium 133 era, although I did technically skip it. I think I went from a DX4100 to a Pentium 166. So I never sat in that middle zone with the P133, but nevertheless, I have very similar memories from those machines that I actually had back in the day. And we can try out some games, see how they perform, see if this stands up to that, um, and maybe some applications. If you've got any suggestions of things that you used to play that you'd like to see running on this in the final episode, let me know, we'll get them installed, and then we will find a permanent place for this to take up residence, perhaps next to that older Packard bell, so we can have the 486 and the Pentium side by side. Maybe the Amstrad Mega PC to the left, so we can go 386, 486, Pentium, and whatever else we've got to create a PC zone, maybe here in the lab. Um, we'll figure it all out in the final episode. It's gonna be fun just to use it, and I might do just a tiny final bit of retro writing. I completely forgot the mouse, so I might just do a bit of vapor brighting on that just to brighten it up and have another little go on the gray plastics. But even if we don't, it looks damn good if I do say so myself compared to what we started with. Anyway, I'm blathering now. So um, I will see you in the next episode. And uh, one last thing, I have really enjoyed using this lab. It's made working on this so much more efficient and I hope you're gonna reap the benefits of it in future videos as we do more and more repairs. Okay, take care. See you next time. Bye-bye everyone. Thank you for taking the time to listen to today's episode. If you enjoyed it and like what I do on the channel, join the official Cave Dwellers over at patreon.com forward slash RMC Retro.